I will call to order the Monday, June 20th, 200, 2011 uh, meeting of the Sioux Falls City Council, our informational meeting. Welcome to all of you that are here in Carnegie and those at home. Um, we'll start out with uh, Deborah Owen, our City Clerk Chief of Council Operations. She will give the City Council staff report. Thank you and good afternoon, Sioux Falls City Council. In terms of your dist districting commission uh, resolution that will be coming forward to you on July 5th, the names that we have uh, from each of your districts are Andy Traub, Ann Reeve Randall, Rick Noby, Mary Glensky, and Lynn Keller Forbes. Looking forward to working with those folks, uh, but again, you'll be approving that on July 5th. In addition, uh, as the council would know from our working session, but the, the resolution for the CCOG and the UDC appointments by the city council will also be on July 5th for you to vote on. And then there's an item that just was handed out now, so I, I say this more for those who are listening online, is uh, the attachments that aren't available with the presentations today um, will be uploaded tomorrow. They've come to our clerk's office now, and so I know we, we hear from you often with email, so please know that we'll upload those tomorrow. And for those who are in attendance here, you can certainly get those at the uh, resource table to the side of the dais. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Ms. Owen? Thank you. On to report of the meeting of Monday, June 13th for the Public Services Committee. Councillor Anderson, Jr. All right, thank you. On our meeting Monday, June 13th, uh, we had two items on the agenda. One was council procedures and organization uh, dealing with Robert's Rules of Order and how the council operates. And that has been forwarded to the council. Uh, the second item was administrative appeals ordinance. Uh, that is um, working with the uh, city attorney's office and that also has been forwarded to the council for consideration. Uh, at that point, uh, we really do not have anything else on our agenda. Thank you. Are there any questions for Councillor Anderson, Jr.? If not, we will go on to City Council open discussion. Councillor Karski. Yes, I just wanted to let the uh, council know that last Tuesday at High V on 10th and um, Kiwanis, um, they had a neighborhood meeting of the um, 10th, 10th Street and Western Avenue neighborhoods, basically. A lot of construction going on out there and a lot of concerns from the neighbors, but um, Officer uh, Larson, I believe it was, from the Sioux Falls, yes, Jim Larson from the police department was the facilitator. Um, it was attended by nearly 50 of the people that lived out in that neighborhood. So to me, that's fantastic attendance for a voluntary neighborhood meeting like that. Um, and there were about nine different um, departments from the Sioux Falls um, city that were represented there from streets to health, um, lighting, etc. And um, the people were very involved and just, I thought it was a very positive meeting. Um, there were concerns, from what I can tell, all of them have been addressed and will be resolved shortly if they haven't been resolved already. But it, I have to commend our city employees and the people that were there for working together and uh, their concern for their neighborhood and for getting things done. Thank you, Councillor Karski. Are there any questions for, for Councillor Karski? Any other open discussion items? Quiet group this afternoon. All right, we'll go on to presentations. Director Turbeck, the May monthly financial report. Thank you, Councillor. If there's somebody in the uh, room that can get this projector uh, and PowerPoint up and running, I'm, I'm not informed on the, the login information. Mark, can you help us?
my report was going to, going to be rather brief, and uh, I guess without my slides, it might be even, even briefer. So um, I'll take a shot at it, running through. Uh, you have, I believe, hard copies in front of you, so I can, uh, at least for the benefit of the council, uh, and, and there were public copies available as well, so the folks here uh, could at least follow along on the, uh, on the hard copies. The, uh, the presentation today, I, I wanted to touch on a few economic indicators, very similar to what we typically do on our monthly reports, um, give you an update on the sales tax uh, picture for the city, as well as uh, just a, a general overview of the uh, revenue and expenditure data so far to date for the general fund, uh, and then touch on a couple of other uh, very brief items. First, uh, first economic indicator that we do track uh, is the unemployment figure. The, uh, the, the first uh, graphic that I had for you is a, uh, an update showing the 2009, 2010, and then so far to date the 2011 unemployment figures. And you can see that uh, over this past month, the local unemployment rate has dropped uh, from a month ago at 5.5% down to 4.7%. So that's certainly a, a positive development um, in the unemployment. The, uh, the next chart is a comparison of the, the local unemployment rate with the state and the national uh, unemployment figures. You can see, as, as you've grown accustomed to, I'm sure, the local uh, unemployment picture compares very favorably to the national rate. Currently, the national rate is at 9%. State is at 4.8 percent, and again, our local uh, MSA is showing an unemployment rate of 4.7 percent. So we compare very favorably. Uh, it's been uh, relatively flat for the past couple of years uh, for 2009 and, and 2010, and so far in 2011. Statewide, uh, job growth has been rather flat. Uh, the state, state growth rate in jobs is running right at 0 percent nationally. And locally here in Sioux Falls, the growth rate in, in jobs uh, is positive. The trend is, is upward. And uh, we, we've seen uh, for the past year uh, 600 jobs created here in Sioux Falls from April through April, although it's a rather tepid, uh, a tepid growth rate. At least it's uh, heading in the, in the right direction. Building permits, uh, year to date, we've uh, issued about $104 million in building permits. That lags uh, behind 2010. We're running ahead of 2009. Uh, May was a, a very good month for building permits. Uh, we issued uh, over $39 million in building permits in the month of May, uh, which is about a $9.4 million increase over May of 2010, uh, which uh, translates to about a 32% uh, increase in that uh, May over May figure. We are starting to close the gap on the year-to-date numbers with, with last year, with the uh, uh, month of May being quite strong. Turning to sales tax uh, figures, year-to-date, January through May, our overall sales tax increase is at 1.6 percent. That does include audits. You've heard me mention that uh, in the last few presentations that we do track the uh, underlying sales tax collections along with uh, uh, what the State Department of Revenue collects when they go into audit uh, retailers. If we filter out the audit collections, uh, the underlying growth rate uh, year to date is up about 4.2 percent. So those audits do tend to uh, distort the year to date numbers, uh, particularly when we had such a, a significant audit collection in January of, of 2010. So those, do, those audits do tend to distort the, the uh, in a shorter term uh, time frame, like five months, when we're looking at January through May, that can tend to distort the, the growth rate. So the next two, next two graphics you have uh, are attempting to filter out that, the effect of short-term variations in our collections. The first one is a cumulative 12-month rolling growth rate in our sales tax collections. That does include audit collections, but because of, we're looking at a 12-month rolling time period, that uh, any month-to-month -month variations tend to be smoothed out. And you can see that uh, uh, since January of 2009 through May of, May of 11, that 12-month rolling rate uh, declined throughout 2009, bottomed out in 2010, and by the fall of 2010, we were back into positive growth territory. And again, those, uh, those include those audit collections. Currently, for the last uh, 12 months, we're running at about a 3.2% 3, 3 
growth rate, including all of those uh, normal collections along with audit collections. You can see that uh, that line is a little bit choppy, uh, and that's a reflection of, of some of those distortions that are caused by audit collections. Whereas in the next chart, I've filtered those out. We've removed the audit collection, so you can see just the regular sales tax collections that vendors remit to the state and that we receive from the State Department of Revenue. It's a little bit smoother line because it, uh, those short-term uh, timing differences in audit collections are filtered out and gives us, I think, a, a better um, picture of really what the underlying consumer and business spending is over this t kind of time frame. And the, uh, for the past year, when we filter out those audit differences, we're growing at about 4.6%. So that's, that's uh, I think, a truer picture of an economic indicator on what the uh, spending is in the local economy rather than the, than the preceding chart. The, uh, the next chart uh, gives you a, a very high-level picture of the general fund revenue and expenditure year-to-date. You can see we're, we're tracking, uh, uh, I should say we are right on track with our budget uh, and on both the revenues and expenditures, up slightly on both from a year ago, which is, uh, I think, what you would probably expect. The uh, uh, revenues are up about 1.3% and expenditures are up about 2% from this point uh, last year. In May, we saw seven construction projects go to bid. We had uh, an average of four bidders on each, each of those projects, with the low bid in each case averaging about 12% below estimate, so that we're con continuing to see a favorable bidding climate for those construction projects. The last, uh, last slide that you have is, uh, I wanted to point this out because this is a new, uh, new thing that we've added to your monthly report. Uh, this is a summary on the uh, arterial streets funding. This shows historical data on the sources of funding for arterial streets and how much has been spent in 2009, 2010, and then so far in 2011. You'll find that same information again on page 12 of your monthly report. That's something that we will plan to continue to uh, include in your monthly financial report. That concludes the, uh, the presentation. I would certainly try to answer any questions that the counselors have. Questions for Director Turback. No questions? Thank, Thank you for you. bearing with me without my uh, without my presentation slides on the screen. I appreciate that. Thank you. We'll now go on to naming rights task one findings uh, by representatives from superlative. And I take it that Good afternoon. Darren Smith, Director of Community Development. And I thought by pushing two buttons the blue screen would go away. Um, and maybe uh, it's supposed to. I'm going to try that one. Okay, it is working. <laughs> Again, good afternoon. Uh, as you'll recall, uh, back on May 2nd at the City Council meeting, this City Council um, approved a supplemental appropriation to provide funds to hire uh, a consulting firm to assist us with the naming rights and sponsorship market analysis for a potential new event center. Uh, today, those consultants are here to present their task one findings, and again, if you'll, you'll recall, uh, the study is broken down, or the market analysis is broken down into three phases or, or three tasks. Uh, task one, again, was to look at uh, the, the potential Sioux Falls Event Center to give us an overview of current trends in naming rights and markets, comparable pricing, uh, determination of fair value for a number of different things, uh, listing of different inventories, and then uh, identifying potential uh, uh, categories or sponsor categories or, or industries. Um, again, today uh, here to do that 
is uh, Miles Gallagher, president of the superlative group, a firm out of Cleveland. Uh, you'll probably recognize Miles because he was here in April and made a presentation on this very topic on the front end of the process. Also with him today is Jeff Orloff, uh, vice president from the superlative group, and they're going to do uh, a tag team presentation and present the findings, and again, you have in front of you the PowerPoint presentation that is up on the screen, as well as the market analysis uh, findings document itself. So with that, I'll turn it over to Miles. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me back. I'm Miles Gallagher, and I, as uh, Darren said, I brought Jeff Orlov with, with me. He's our senior VP of uh, analytics. I'm the president of the company. As I mentioned in my presentation to you in April, I started the firm 17 years ago, and we represent the taxpayer. That's, a, that's our credo. Um, we've sold over $500 million worth of naming rights to date. Uh, we're at about 95% when it comes to arenas and hitting our projections, and we're over 100% with ballparks and stadiums. So we're pretty proud of our record. Jeff, next slide. This is Jeff Orloff. He can stand up, Jeff. He'll be up here in a moment. <laughs> we're standing up. Um, and what we'll do is we'll take you through a presentation that will show you um, we've analyzed the market. We've looked at what naming rights and what uh, some primary sponsorships will be. In a, we, we have some ranges we're going to take you through. And we've also, part of our step two in, of our task was to look at some premium seating. We've moved some of that forward just to give you an idea of what we expect to see. But these are a list of some of our clients. And in particular, I'd like you to pay or, or take note of Sedgwick County, which is the Interest Bank Arena, which we just finished up about a year and a half ago. St. Louis University, which is Chaffetz Arena that we finished up three years ago. And Xavier University, where we sold, we valued and sold all the sponsorships and naming rights and seating for the Cintas Center. Now, Xavier and St. Louis University are private schools, so they're not part of the charts you'll see. But I will tell you combined, because they ask us not to share what theirs were individually, combined they got over $29 million in naming rights. So for two small schools, the largest with 6,000 students, uh, we're very proud of that work. Can we go to the next slide? Um, we were hired by the city of Sioux Falls to look at the uh, 12,000 seat um, event center. We were, we were hired to look at the naming rights, which is you know, the name of the facility, and then premium sponsorships, where we look at several categories, and then we were asked to look at internally what were some elements that we could find some value in that we could put into premium seat or into uh, sponsorships. We were also asked to look at um, luxury suite sales, which we've moved ahead to give you an inkling of what you can see. And then additionally, we were asked to look at local sponsorships. What could local business owners do to participate? So when, when we're doing sponsorships with perhaps a national beer or a soft drink company, what could local company owners participate in? So we're going to take you through that now. Brief, tif, brief history of naming rights. Um, there are several people that try to claim they, they know the beginning of naming rights. And, and what we see in sports was when Budweiser tried to put their name on the stadium in St. Louis back in 1953. And our academic friends will tell us that um, Harvard was the first one to put his name on a building when he gave several thousand um, golden coins to name a university after himself in Man Massachusetts. Um, in sports, the largest deals that we've seen to date recently was the Barclays Center in New York City. It's over $20 million a year. On a 20-year deal, it's over $400 million in naming rights. And we're showing you this because naming rights is trending upward. So we, we've seen the pit of the recession, we're coming out, we're starting to close deals again, but we haven't had to move backwards in naming rights, like in a lot of ad rights we have. Um, and, you know, as salespeople, we're pretty pleased to see that. And the next slide is what we've been asked to come here to present, and we've, uh, we've had some lengthy discussions. We generally don't like to publish a rate or a range before a sales phase because you're telling people what you'll expect or what you'll take, but we were encouraged um, by the administration to share the range with you. And we feel very comfortable with this range. We've done an analysis. Jeff's going to take us through the quantitative and qualitative benefits to show you how we came up with 
with the elements of our numbers. But we're very comfortable that you'll see between 350000 and $500,000 a year for naming rights for your facility. Almost all naming rights deals signed in the past 10 years have been for 20-year contracts. The industry standard is 3%. So we're comfortable in telling you that you will see between $9.4 million and $13.4 million for your naming rights. What I'm going to do is introduce Jeff Orloff again. He's going to take us through the, what most of our salespeople call the boring part, which is the stats, to show you how we put this together. And then I'll come up with the sizzle again, and we'll talk about what some of the sponsorships are worth and how we intend on helping you get them. So, Jeff Orloff. Um, a title sponsorship naming rights partner for the event center um, is going to benefit for a num from a number of things, um, certainly a lot greater reach, um, better marketing via the naming rights as people talk about the, the, the center. Um, obviously, the, this type of venue is going to attract huge numbers of people each year depending on the size of the complex. Um, addition, in addition, there will be millions of other impressions uh, through people passing by on the city streets, the highways, and, and in media. Um, what we've done here is put together, we put together a couple different charts. Um, these are, this is a list of several different uh, arenas and their naming rights sponsors over the last um, uh, 20 years um, to give you an idea of kind of comparative so you, you'll see that our numbers are not uh, out of range one way or the other um, and kind of the number, the term, as well as the other benefits, as well as the size. Um, title sponsorship naming rights come with significant media exposure. Um, the way that we undertake this is by looking at um, the 2010 coverage, um, which we obtained related to the arena, the convention center, and other activities related to them. Um, what we then do uh, is take a 50% reduction to the total figure to account for waste, um, cost of reaching a target audience, quality of the exposure received, uh, as well as reduced rates uh, that are offered by the media. Um, the number we put in front of you will, we feel, is, is a, a very safe number and, and will probably increase over time. Um, and you can see here, the media exposure was based on a number of different things, television, radio, uh, and print media, uh, and there will also be, obviously, some other exposures as well. Title sponsorship naming rights as it relates to quantitative benefits, um, a, a naming rights sponsor will will benefit from a variety of sources other than the media. Um, this is going to include signage exposure on and around the arena, as well as uh, logos and advertisements um, on wayfinding signs, which are directional signs, uh, and numerous other signs throughout the building, including exit and entrance signage, concourse signage, naming rights signage throughout the building inside, uh, signage on and around concession areas, uh, as well as signage related to pouring rights. There are others, but we just put a few here. And again, um, what we show here is, is a listing of some quantitative benefits and uh, the number that we came up with as it related to um, what we felt the annual value added up to in all of these categories. Uh, market value benchmarking goes back to what we were talking about a little bit before, which is that we benchmarked this, these figures against other multi-purpose event centers. Uh, and their agreements so that it was in line, we made sure it was in line with the market value. Um, payment schedules for title naming, title sponsorship naming rights can vary significantly, but at this point what we're seeing and what we've seen um, is what we're putting in front of you, which is they're usually for between 20 and 25 years. Um, say We have come up with, as for benchmarking, we've showed you both the, the total number of years as well as split it up by the, the number of years, I'm sorry, total, and then based it against the number of years, which you'll see in the next slide. Um, again, a number of uh, arenas um, that um, have both the uh, full value of what the title sponsorship was as well as a value over the number of years. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Um, premium sponsorship packages. Another area we were asked to value were premium sponsorship packages. 
So what we did is we looked at different elements within the facility. We have, we have different categories that in every facility around the country we sell sponsorships. And sponsorships are generally sold for, let's say, automotive, soft drink, sponsorships for beer, telecom, um, and insurance or banking or finance. Um, we were asked to look within this facility and we worked with Sink Combs and came up with areas and said, all right, what are unique to the facility that we can actually attach a sponsorship to? So we looked at concourse sponsorship naming rights. This is something that we had most recently done at the Interest Bank Arena. We sold the naming rights to the concourse to Spirit Aviation. We looked at entrance and exit uh, sponsorships, so actually gate sponsorships. So this was done first at Cleveland Brown Stadium where we were able to name the gates after uh, the Cleveland Clinic, NCB Bank, Corecom Communications. And that was, um, it brought in additional revenue just from telling people they would enter the building through the name your sponsor gate. It, it worked out quite well. Uh, banking, ATMs, and locations. Whenever we do a sponsorship in the banking category, we, we include ATMs. We know that banks will pay a fee to have an ATM located where there's a throughput of customers that can and will have to use an ATM for cash. We'll build that into a sponsorship package that'll include signage around the facility and probably signage with one of the, the uh, tenants of the facility, whether it's a team or not. Uh, atrium naming rights and non-alcoholic beverage pouring rights. Um, th there's not a facility where we haven't gone in and done a pouring rights deal with a soft drink vendor. Just that's, that's the first one you do after naming rights because you can get it done relatively quickly. Part of that sponsorship package could and will include things like if you go with a soft drink company, then you might ask them to cover the cost of the cup holders behind all the seats. You'll build that right into their package. So they'll be giving you an annual fee of, let's say, between 150 and maybe up to 175 a year. And they would get their name on the, the cup backs. They would get signage in the facility, right to pour their beverages. And then they would have to sell you products at their cost. Um, when we look at the additional revenue, we're comfortable with a range between 250 and 625,000 in additional revenue per year. And our goal would be to take it up higher than that, but this is a very comfortable and conservative number. So when we look at that and we take this out, you can add an additional revenue stream of 6.8 million to 16.8 in sponsorships. And that's again, what we're doing is we're taking this over a 20 year period and the average increase is 3% a year. That's just what sponsorships get. They go up 3% per year. In the premium sponsorships, we want to look at some other things that we, we've added in and into the facility that we see you could be selling sponsorships to. We've gone over banking, banking centers, concourse signage. Uh, we think beer gardens, pouring rights, scoreboard signage, um, we're also looking at inclusion of sponsors in calendars or events. So when we put together our package, we might look at a, an exposure as the front of the ticket. The ticket might say the XYZ Center. There's a media impression there. So we're including all this in the sponsorships. You go to the next slide? Yeah. Media exposure. I'll, I'll take this, Jeff. Um, again, in media exposure, we're looking at where the sponsor is going to get named because of their sponsorship. So when it's a soft drink company, it'll be every time somebody buys a beverage. It'll be everybody that walks in the facility based on the signage they see inside the facility, and it, and it would be on any exterior signage also. Jeff, you want to handle quantitative benefits, and then I'll come right back up for the suites. Basically, what we've done here for the premium sponsorships versus the title, there are certainly going to be a great deal uh, of additional categories for the title sponsorship, but inclusive in the premium will be some of the same things that are in the title sponsorship, um, such as area-specific signage, wayfinding, parking, interior concourse signage, as well as scoreboard signage and, and possibly calendar events. Um, again, it depends on how you package it and, and where you've gone with your title sponsor, but those are the kind of benefits that are included in the premium sponsorship packages. Luxury suites, as I said earlier, that we were asked, this is in our actually in, in our task two, 
but we were asked to speed it up and, and add these numbers in part of task one so you can get an idea of what you'll expect to see in terms of numbers from premium seating. And we've met, we've talked to St. Combs about it. We feel comfortable that you'll be able to sell 15 to 18 suites in the marketplace. We've benchmarked them at 25,000 as a minimum and maybe as high as 37,000 a year per suite. In the premium seating industry, what we, what we always recommend is that you stagger some of your contracts so that if you decide to do hypothetically 15 suites, you don't sell them all on five-year contracts and in five years you have to sell your entire inventory again. So you stagger them. You have some on five-year contracts, some on seven, and some on 10-year contracts. So that you never have to go through the process of selling all of the inventory at once again. We take these numbers and we take it out on a term of 20 years And 15 suites sold at 25,000 a year would be 10,077,000. 18 suites sold at 37,000 a year would be 18 million. So that's the additional revenue you can see. Now in our task two, which is the next phase of our report that we're to begin now, we're also gonna be looking at club seats and loge boxes. So we're comfortable this number is gonna go nowhere but up. Even if we take the, if we take the minimal numbers at 25, thousand per year and we add our club seats we'll go past this number so when we're asked to put this number in we feel very comfortable because we still haven't there's more to be added yet is our point so this is a very conservative and again we're very comfortable giving you this number additional local sponsorships the administration asked us to pay particular attention and said you know what else can we do to make sure that our sponsorships aren't all sold to national companies. We said, well, let's do some, let's do some local, local company-based sponsorships. Let's look at, at paver programs. We've done trash receptacle programs where people sponsor different parts of, of receptacles around facilities. Concession partner programs. That could be where a local hot dog vendor sells their hot dogs through the concession contract with the concessionaire. It could be you know, any type of local food company. And we encourage them. They're actually they're good for the community and everybody gets to participate. Um, we have food cart programs that we'll recommend and we'll work with whoever your, your arena manager is. Uh, family rest areas, upgraded seats of the night, those are generally done with local sponsorships. In addition, we'll also recommend you might want to do a children's play area, business centers, or even first aid stations sponsored by healthcare companies. And our conclusions. Um, our conclusions, we think there's significant revenue here. I mean, when, when uh, when I was here in April, um, I think uh, one of the council, one of you asked me, you know, why do you want to, why are you here, why would you want this business? We think it's lucrative. We think, we know there's revenue in a new facility. We think your title sponsorship, your naming rights, your premium sponsorship categories, your premium seating, and your additional local sponsorships will bring you significant revenue. So our, these are our recommendations, um, and we've got a further chart after this too. Our recommendations are that you look at an naming rights agreement between on a 20-year contract. As we've shown in the chart, the majority of them are for 20 years now, even though the original ones came out in the early 90s. Some of them were 10-year deals, some were just a little shorter. Most of those have renewed or been sold to somebody else. All the new contracts are going out at 20 years or just under with renewal options. We're comfortable that that can bring you between 9.4 million and 13.4 million. We think your premium sponsorship deals, um, getting you in a range of between 250 and 625,000 a year, and that's at different levels. Some will be 50, some will be 125, one, you know, some will be 175. We're very comfortable that 625 is a very conservative number and that you can put that right into your pro forma. Um, that'll bring an additional 6.8 million, upwards of 16. 0.8 million if, if you sell out all of these. In addition, luxury suites, uh, we're comfortable with selling 18 suites in the marketplace. We think it can be done. Um, we've looked at this anywhere between 25,000 and 37,500 a year. And that can bring an additional of uh, 10 million, 77,000, up to 18 million a year on a 20 year program. And again, remember I mentioned that you stagger those contracts on five, seven, and 10 but we ran these numbers at 20 years, you, you've got to assume you're going to resell these suites. Do not, no one builds a suite to say we're going to sell one contract and have it sit empty. 
Um, there are additional sponsorships that haven't been determined. So again, some of those would be local, some would be you know, just different categories that we haven't identified. You know, we look at 10 years ago, if somebody said we were gonna do a water sponsorship, they would have been told they're crazy. It's the number one selling beverage in America now is bottled water. So, but in 10 years ago, you couldn't buy a bottle of water. It's free out of a tap, right? Um, so what we did is we looked at the overall um, revenue stream uh, between 975 and 1.8 million a year, which brings you between 26 million and 48 million on a 20 year period. We've laid this out in an income range statement at the back of the report to give you a better idea, or more succinct, I should say. Um, and then what I'll do is I know everybody's gonna wanna come back to that page and we'll be happy to answer your questions, but let's look at next steps first and then we'll come back. Um, next steps are developing a list of target accounts. Some are gonna be national, some will be regional. And um, develop a, a recommended strategy. You know, historically what we've done is sell the most expensive things first. That's always naming rights. And then come back in with the next things in line, which would be your premium sponsorships. And then you do your seating. Um, let's see, we would then at that point agree on a, a timeline and a strategy on who to go after. Um, there might be companies that you don't want to have associated with your facility. There might be some that you think we should target right away. And then here's some categories. Um, these are categories that we've sold in almost every facility we've been into. Healthcare, automotive, financial services, telecom, soft drink, beer, manufacturing, and then local service industries. Um, now, we can go back to that page that you're going to have all your questions on. Okay. Questions for Mr. Gallagher or Mr. Orloff? Councillor Karski. If I could, I have two or three questions. Yeah. If, do I have time for that? Okay. Uh, first question, you have a 95% success rate in meeting and exceeding your yep. naming rights. Uh, what's the farthest you've been, ever been off by? Um, it's not being off by. We, we had one that um, we were hired to sell the name rights to the Tacoma Dome. Um, we brought in an offer, which was right in the range, and the mayor scuttled the deal because he didn't want to have Comcast Communications associated with the dome. They were on a pre-approved list. Um, we've always sold it. We've always hit our range, but that... You know, that's in my crow. That's a deal that we had sold that was scuttled. Um, and you can Google all the reports on it. So other than that, we've hit our range every time in arenas. That's the one we missed. Okay. And we, okay. we got it. It just, and it was a pre-approved list. So something I will not forget for many hundreds of years. It's emblazoned on my mind. Okay. I, I can actually tell you what the commission would have been. So can two of my salesmen. Uh, next question. Sure. Explain to me the concept of a luxury seating. I mean, if I if I had the money and I bought uh, tickets or a luxury box at you know the Minnesota Vikings at um, stadium there, I'd obviously have tickets to all the games. But here, the luxury seating doesn't necessarily mean that you get tickets to all those events. So explain that concept to me. Well, there are two ways to price that, and a lot of it has to do with whoever your arena manager is going to be. So sometimes you sell it with the tickets included to all events. Sometimes you exclude the tickets. Sometimes you include tickets to main tenants, but you can't include tickets to like maybe the concerts that are coming because you don't know who's coming in a few years. And the promoter might have to pay, let's say you have an arena management company and they bring in you know, Elton John and his tickets are expensive. And if they've already quoted you a price with your suite with the tickets included, the promoter can lose their shirt. So there are two ways to do it. You can include tickets or you can exclude tickets. Um, in your example with the Vikings, you'd have tickets to every Vikings game. Here you would have tickets probably to your main tenants and then you would have first right to buy the tickets. We, we've sold suites in about three or four different ways and what we do is work with you and whoever's gonna manage the facility. Our recommendation would be, the last thing you wanna do is have us sell everything, tickets included or excluded, and then hand that to an arena manager because it would be a nightmare for them. They'd either have to include all these tickets and be stuck buying them, or they would have to go out and resell all the tickets. So we'd come up with some hybrid, depending on who's going to manage your building, and what they think is going to be best for the business model. 
Is that, I tried not to talk around your question. It's just, no, that's There's just that different ways to do it. my question. Okay. okay. Thank you. We've done, this is not our first rodeo. I mean, we've done suite sales at all of these facilities. Questions? Um, Councilor Rolfing. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, your sales team, uh, yes. what is it composed of, and or could we do it ourselves, or what would be your recommendation? Obviously, um, yeah. Well, we're salespeople. We would like you to hire us. Um, on naming rights, it's, it's a pretty difficult sale. Uh, and, you know, we look at contracts like uh, in Tacoma where we went back and forth and we had 51 iterations of the contract. It took a year. Interest Bank took us almost 18 months to close after we first met with the people at Interest Bank that bought the naming rights. It's not as easy as it sounds or everybody would do it, right? Um, so on our sales team on naming rights, I get involved in all the naming rights sales. They're big ticket sales, and I love, I love the rest of our staff, but if it's, if it's a $10 million sale, I'm the guy on it. That's just, I like to do it, and I'm pretty good at it. Um, when it comes to premium sponsorships, you know, I would work with one of our people. We'd put somebody in market while we did this. Probably going to be a year or two year sales process. Um, on premium seating, we'll, we'll bring somebody into the market. In, in some instances, we'll team up with the university and, and bring somebody in from their graduate program. We've done that with Wichita State, Xavier University, St. Louis University. And it's, it's a place for us to bring in people. We train them, and they become our employees. So we've hired people that we brought in on specific projects, and that's for selling like club seats. You know, if a club seat sales a couple thousand dollars, we don't need to have somebody flying in to work on that sale. We'll bring somebody in, we'll train them, we'll train them back in Cleveland, and then we'll work with them, and in every instance, we've hired those people. It's just, it's our business model, it works, works well. Councilor Brown. I just want to make sure I understand the 95% the success yeah. rate. So for example, on this one, yep. um, the range is 26 million to 48 million, roughly. So if you fall in that range, that's going to be adding to your success rate at, at that 95% success rate? Yes. Because that's now, a big gap. Well, it's a big gap. Um, we're comfortable th that they're very conservative numbers. So let's look, at each, let's look at each phase of that. And you'll have to prove that. So when we come in and on naming rights, we looked at this and it killed us to put out a low and a high on naming rights because we just told the marketplace what, what to expect to pay. Never done that. But we were encouraged by the administration that the council would want to see that. So we've done it. Um, never done that before. It's just We just don't do that. Are we comfortable we can hit that number? Yep, absolutely comfortable. So I have no problem hitting that number. When I look at the sponsorships, are we comfortable we can hit that number? Absolutely. I mean, we look at those different categories that we, I just explained. There are other things that we haven't included in there that we'll come up with later on. We'll come up with an area. When they're doing final design of the facility, we'll find a big wall that would be a mural. We'll sell a sponsor to the mural. You know, just, we, you know, our people have a knack for finding out what else can we sell. I mean, we're, we're paid salespeople. Can we get a name on that? I mean, if I could, I'd sell a sandwich board sign and have you walk around Downtown, if I get enough money, I'll try talking you into it. Just, we look for other things to sell. And then premium seating, I know we can hit the number. We haven't even included club seats or loge boxes in here. So if you said, look, we're only going to do eight suites, I still got club seats and loge boxes I can include. And that's, that's part of our task, too. But Darren said you wanted to see some of those numbers now. I said, okay, let's give them a flavor of what's going to come in. And, yeah, we can hit that number. So... Thank you. Will it be part of it? Absolutely. And I have no problem that we'll hit the number. Councillor Antiman. Thank you. It is a process, though. So it's something yeah. that you don't plan on coming in, and in six months you're going to have this baby knocked out. No, you can't it's have It's something that that's way. It's a process. It's a process. It, when we look at it, um, we, we look at naming rights. The gestation of a naming rights takes 12 to 18 months. During that process, you might get lucky. Someone might say, I have to have it. I'm ready, let's move forward now. Generally, you line up who you think you're gonna call on, you start your first few meetings. You know, we might start with 40 companies, work our way down to 20 that can, can afford it, 10 that might be interested, five become real, real targets, and then you, you have to go through the process with them. It's not like a bid situation where you put it out and say, who wants to put their name on it? You know, God forbid everybody bids low, you'd, 
you'd really be upset. Uh, another question too about as far as the timeline goes. If if you know it. I think uh, if by chance we are able to build this, we go ahead, we build it, and we have it built in the fall of uh, 2014, say, uh, can you give us an idea of how long do you anticipate the naming rights process taking? Uh, would you have pretty much everything on board by the time they turn the key in the door? For naming rights, Or does yeah. it go on? I would recommend starting your naming rights now. A company that buys naming rights can take advantage of the fact that their name's on it during construction. You know, it's, they get, they get, Coors did that with Coors Field. They, they announced it two years before it opened. They got two years of free naming rights. I think, I think it's amazing. Barclays is doing it. Thank, way to snicker that out. Barclays did it too. Barclays they closed that up last year. It doesn't open until the end of this year. So, yeah, you do your naming rights first, and then you start working on your, your um, premium sponsorships. Some of those sponsors, let's say we're looking at the telecom category. Telecom might include, um, we say, okay, telecom company, here's what we want to sell you, a package that includes, you know, 10 things. And we want you to pay for the TV screens and the monitors and all of the hallways, vomitories, the suites, and the lounges. Because they might pay not just with cash, but they might give you equipment. They might give you wiring in the facility. I mean, it might ultimately reduce the construction cost of the building. And we, we just did that in Interest Bank Arena. It's, a, it's the exact model we used. We used Cox Communications and they came in and they bought a 10-year sponsorship and part of what they did was they paid with services and some, not all, but some services and equipment. You know, we just won't discount. Thank you. Councilor Jamison. <laughs> Tell me the advantages and disadvantages if if, say, we uh, found a title sponsor for this event center prior to it going to an election, are there upsides and downsides? I mean, if somebody said, yes, put my name on it, and then it goes to a public vote, I can see all the advantages of it passes that you've been talking about, we've been talking about yeah. as the uh, XYZ center. But if the voters turn it down, it's also been talked about as the XYZ center right. that got voted down. Would you do that right away, or would you still wait for the title sponsor? You know, the Aircom Stadium that never was built in Dublin, the President Aircom thinks it was the best thing he ever committed to buying because people talked about Aircom Stadium for years while they're trying sure. to put it together. Uh, it didn't get built. You know, he, they were out of pocket zero. So I don't think it would hurt. Um, if your question is, would the company be upset, or would they? Right. You know, if you could do that before a vote, um, you'd have some contract in place, at least a memor memorandum of understanding. Um, you, you might be able to get a down payment. You'd probably just have to give it back. I mean, that would, that would be spelled out in your memorandum of understanding. But I, mean, I wouldn't count on doing something before a vote. It's that we're always asked, how quickly can you do it? You know, it's like having a baby it usually takes about nine months. Gestation period for this, it's about 12 months. Okay, and then one other question, if I could. On your title sponsorship naming rights uh, list that you have, yep. uh, the only one of recent really is that interest bank. Do you have any others that are of current nature, like in the last few years? That yeah, um, St. Louis University, the Chaffetz Center, and we, and we can't, because it's a private school, give you all the details, but that was just a couple of years ago. Um, DCU Arena in Worcester, Massachusetts, that just signed three years ago. That's, uh, that's a 20-year deal at nine point. Jeff, you got the page number? I think we've listed most of those on one. On, Are those on, on the uh, market value page? What page is that? Jeff, can you just, just shoot that one? Right there. I can't read that. Yeah, it's 20 years at 9.6 million DCU. Dunkin' Donuts just renewed, <clears throat> excuse me, two months ago. I mean, they're happening again. Just, you know, we've gone through the troughs of the, you know, the recession, the yeah. Great Recession, and we're coming back out. So we're seeing these close again. So as we were talking to some of your folks today, we just did a, 
a soft drink deal in Dublin, Ireland. Um, they thought that they would never get done there, and we wrapped that up in the height of what they are in right. is a depression. They have mass, mass unemployment. The country's taken over the banks. And originally, they thought maybe they'd be lucky to get a few hundred thousand euros, and we got 2.9 million euros on a 10-year contract. It's, I mean, it's happening, even in the worst of economies, it's happening. That's what I was kind of wondering, if the uh, market has, uh, if the economy has affected these kinds of agreements. If you see an uptick or if things are coming well, around. We're seeing or, it come back. Okay. Um, we're seeing it come back in sponsorships. We're seeing it come back. In, I mean, we're getting hired left and right everywhere. Just, yeah, it's Good. back. Good. It was the first to go off the cliff, and it's the first one back. Councillor Rolfing. I have one, another question, and that is um, when you go out and, and do these uh, sponsorship s sales, how do you handle the in-kind stuff uh, from the standpoint of uh, your commission? What we'll do is we'll take a uh, – we want to get paid on barter and kind and trade. We'll do a fair market value. So if, if you had a line – let's say we were doing that telecom deal we were talking about earlier, and XYZ Telecom Company says, look, we're going to – instead of giving you that – a whole dollar amount. We're going to also we're going to give you less, and we're going to give you televisions. We want to look in your line item. If you had a television line item for twenty five thousand, and we got you free televisions, we want the commission on the twenty five thousand. So it's, it comes off the line item of your building. We're not creating. Oh, we think it's worth that. So if we got you free paint from a paint manufacturer, we're going to look at the line item. What do you have budgeted to paint the building? All right, if we got it for you for free, we want our commission based on what you put in the line item. So we help you with your line items. We want to make sure that you. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, could, people could take advantage of us too if we don't watch it. So I mean, we watch it pretty closely. Other questions? If not, thank you, gentlemen. All right, thanks for having us back out. Director Smith, did you have anything else? Councillor, could, yes. I, could I ask Director Smith a question, though, before he leaves? Okay. Yes. Councillor Rolfing kind of alluded to it, but uh, how much should we pay these folks? What's their percentage? Well, um, I think that's going to be part of any negotiation. Keep in mind the decision would first have to be made to to go that route, to bring a firm like theirs uh, on board. And then at that point, um, you know, again, I, the negotiations um, could and would start. And from what I've learned in this process, it's generally a mix of uh, monthly retainer on some level combined with uh, X percent commission. Uh, but I think it really varies greatly. And what we'd have to do is, of course, do our homework uh, to make sure we got the best uh, the best deal. Then one other question. Would you remind us of the next steps in this process in terms of, you know, uh, you've got them set up for task one, task two, and potentially yep. task three. Would you remind us of that? And then at what point do we start that negotiation with them for that next process, if it were to happen? Yes, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, I will point to here just to start to answer that, the next steps. In task two, you can see, and it is the very last page in your, uh, very last slide in your handout, it does identify very specifically what's in task two. And I would summarize that in, in layman's terms too. We want them to drill down further and confirm some of the information they've given us today on the suites, the luxury suites, the number, the revenue, and so forth, to confirm what they've uh, shared with us today. Then they are also going to look at those loge boxes and club seats. And then the other is we'll start to work with them on developing a strategic plan for then moving forward. So it would have one eye towards the future, so to speak, with what is the next step to possibly put them under contract or consider that or another firm and then move forward with the sales uh, part. And then task three, just not, so we're not forgetting task three, uh, that uh, will address those other facilities. and. Uh, that's important because um, if this facility does end up getting constructed attached to the convention center, uh, two of the three other public facilities that they're going to look at are the convention center and uh, the arena. And what they've been sharing with us 
is that they feel, you know, there's going to be a lot of synergy there in terms of uh, even these naming rights for an event center and how that would tie together with those um, naturally because they would be there. Um, so that will be task three. In terms of the timing, um, one of the last questions, and Miles' answer alluded to that, uh, I think it is something if, uh, if we're pleased with the results of, of their work and we do want to consider taking that next step, um, you know, we'll do that. I, I think that's something I'm you know, personally very much looking forward to working um, with uh, yourself and uh, uh, Council Member Rolfing, I believe, signed up for uh, the naming rights slash sponsorship and marketing uh, committee with this. And I, I think that's a conversation we would need to have um, in conjunction with the mayor and decide what, when is the best timing. And Council Member Jamison alluded to that a little bit here too. Uh, is it is it immediately? Is it later? Again, it's going to depend on when the election is, potentially. So there's some factors there. We've got a little time to figure that out. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other questions for Director Smith? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We are now scheduled to go into an executive session. I would entertain a motion to do so. Madam Chair, I would move that we go into executive session to discuss pending litigation pursuant to SDCL 12523. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. We'll now go into 